podcast hunting Halloween and horror. Greetings, minions and others. I am hijacking the master of the dark arts of haunt marketing and advertising, the voice from hell. You know him as Dick Terhune. Now, Dick, this is my first time down here stepping into the marketing morgue. It's surprisingly clean for all the dissecting and autopsies you do down here on people's haunt advertising. You know, it's... Well, you know, we try to keep a tidy shop. Though you have a lot of messes that you need to clean up for people. You know what I'm happy to say is there are fewer and fewer messes because I think the message has gotten through over the past 10, 11 years that I've been doing this and, you know, making presentations at conventions and dealing directly with clients. I'm happy to say that there are a whole lot fewer catastrophes. But having said that, there's still a lot of bad information, misinformation, and just mistakes being made out there when it comes to the advertising and marketing of haunted attractions and haunted entertainment. How many years have you been in the voiceover business, or spe- specifically your business, the Voice from Hell for Haunt and Pro Haunts? Well, Voice from Hell officially launched in 2008, so 10 years. Uh, But prior to that, I had been working closely with one or two haunted attractions and loved that so much that kind of became the springboard because I thought, well, if it's working so well for these two haunted houses, what's going on in the rest of the country? What's going on in the rest of the world? And what I found was terrifying. It was horrible. So I knew that I would always be busy. That's funny because I just assumed that you've been in the business for many more years because, you know, this is Hotcast's 10th anniversary. And uh, I re- remember getting, I, well, I started Hotcast shortly after I really seriously got back into home haunting. Um, mm. I had done it for years, kind of off and on, nothing very serious. Um, you know, but I you know, throw things together a couple of days before Halloween and um, kind of really seriously started getting into it, building props and learning. And that was all around uh, maybe 2006, 2007. Okay. That's where I kind of discovered some of the, the, you know, the, some of the forums like Halloween Forum, Haunt Forum, et cetera, Haunt World. Um, and then from that, I thought, well, hey, you know, maybe we could start a podcast, even though I didn't know anything about podcasting. I just thought, hey, well, maybe it would be some fun, something I can do off season to keep me busy and kind of plugged in. And I just I remember seeing you all over the place online back then and remember uh, Revenant uh, talking about you and. And I just assumed that you had been around for years before that specializing in haunt marketing. So I don't know. Well, my my origin story is similar, but with a different twist, because back around that time, uh, maybe a year prior to that, I had been seriously thinking about turning some of my property into a pro haunt. Because I, you know, always loved haunting, always loved Halloween, had enough land that I, you know, I I was out mowing one day in this gigantic field. And I thought, you know, I I can see a a parking area over there. I can put a line of porta potties over there. We got tickets, we got concessions. And I was designing scenes in my head and planning out the trail. And I, I knew I really needed more information about it. So, like you, I went to the forums, I went to the magazines, I went to the websites. And so armed with all of this information, I went into my wife and said, honey, here's what we're going to do. And then she laughed really hard for like 15 minutes, like I barely breathing. She was laughing so hard. So I just I just walked out of the room at that point, knew it was a dead issue. But then I, I looked again at the at the pile of books and magazines and the DVDs and everything that I had been collecting. And it was then that it hit me. There was nothing in any of this stuff that was talking about haunt marketing or haunt advertising. It was not actually addressing the thing you need to drive people to buy tickets to come to your attraction. And that was kind of my background. So I decided that's what I needed to do. I knew that people in the business, you know, who put their blood, sweat, and more blood into a haunted attraction could easily be shot down by some DJ doing a bad Lugosi impersonation with 
thriller and thunder sound effects in the background. And I knew, I knew that could never happen again. And I, I, I said out loud at one point, this, you don't need that. You need a voice from hell. And so that's what I became. <laughs> With peals of hellish laughter. <laughs> the clouds parted and the sun shone down on, on your head. It did. <laughs> no, but you were doing, you've been in radio. You're a, you're a product of, of terrestrial radio. Yeah, I was in radio for longer than anybody should be, and then went out on my own to do, to do voiceover and, and my own commercial production. I was basically a small agency for private clients, yeah. and uh, you know when, when one or two of them turned out to be haunted houses, and I got real excited every October because I knew that was my favorite thing to do. You know that was a that was a big red flag for me that oh hey 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 there's something going on here. And maybe I should look a little more further into it. So, you know, I decided to specialize and it's been great. I've met some of the best people in the world, yourself included, Mr. Baker, doing this whole thing. And it's, it's just awesome. I love it. You know, when you, can, when you can do something you love, it ain't working. That's excellent. I mean, I mean, I, it I is know. working, but it's not work. That's what I meant to say. Okay. Um, Back in the early 90s, I worked in radio for uh, uh, several years. I was a production assistant at uh, WZOU in Boston. Mm -hmm. um, so I was working in a you know, top 10 major market radio station. We had a digital editing system. I forget what the name of it was. It, was, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't Pro Sounds. It was some kind of a... Uh, the company's probably not around anymore, but they did have an eight-track digital recording system and... And it was extremely user friendly. I got to learn on that, though I was splicing tape as well. But mm -hmm. um, yeah. and I got I remember one one Halloween I was doing this um, because I used to do freelance DJing at parties and whatnot. So we had a big party that was coming up. It was at this place White's in New Bedford or Fall River or somewhere. And it was going to be from for the what now is UMass Dartmouth, which was like SMU or something like that. And I needed to produce something to play at the beginning of kind of like the show at the beginning of the night. And I sat down and I pulled out Chilling Thrilling Sounds of the Haunted House album and some sound effects. And I was recording and started mixing down. And I, I kind of did like a commercial, but it was more just like this big intro thing that we played probably not more than like 20 seconds long at the at the earlier in the night just to make it sound like a bigger production and i was like oh my god if i could do this in some kind of capacity where i could take my love of halloween and production and radio and whatnot and and do something with it you know there there was no podcasting and there was no way of doing that in a radio format that i could see and I got out of radio shortly, you know, a couple of years later, after I made my millions, you know. Oh, yeah, so you could sit back on your, on your radio yacht and just <laughs> sip cocktails with little umbrellas in them exactly. while being surrounded by supermodels, as we all do when we leave radio. Uh, but it was funny, but I, it, it, years, all these years later, I can, I can still look back at that moment and go, holy shit, I remember that, that that moment where is it sitting there producing things and thinking, oh, if I could only make money doing something like, like, like this for a business, that would be amazing. But anyway, we're getting off track. So, but you know what? I, I just want to say to everybody who's listening, you had a moment like that. I had a moment like that. When you have a moment like that, that is your cue. That's what you need to do. Clearly, your passion has surfaced. You've connected with it. You realize it. And that's what you have to go balls to the wall and do. Okay, end of sermon. The reason I'm having this conversation that I've got to, you know, once again, it kind of hijacked the marketing morgue is um, that I may be a paying customer. So finally, after putting up with me for all these years, you know, there may be a benefit on your end. Ah, Mr. Baker, come in, sit in the good chair. Yes, let me get you an espresso. <laughs> So anyway, so I thought, hey, you know what? Let's sit down just as if I'm a client because I am. Um, because I said if I ever do a pro haunt, you'd be my man, of course. So I guess what I wanted to do is have you kind of uh, 
walk through the process with me, talking to me about, you know, what we're doing, what we're planning on doing, et cetera. Now, I'm pretty easy because I'm a, well, I don't know if I'm easy, but. Uh, no, you I'm, are. I'm, you a, are. Cl- I'm a clean slate right now because I haven't done anything. I haven't done any marketing. I haven't done any advertising. Um, I don't have a theme, a hot name. All of these things need to be done. I guess just the, the reason that I'm at this point is I've been thinking about this for the last few years, especially with increasing headaches with my neighbors, because the haunt is growing exponentially in my home haunt without me doing anything. Like I am seriously not promoting it online. I'm posting to like my Facebook friends, but none of these people live anywhere near me. I have two Facebook accounts, one real life account, and one is my kind of foolish Haunt Halloween, Haunt Cast uh, account, which is usually the only one I use. The other one I use for my real life business, and, I, and once again, I don't really do much with it. But anyway, well, that's, so your, I, that's I your yard. Your yard hot has grown, yeah, basically been, beyond the yard. Exactly. And now another person who was in town uh, a few years ago. We both got served by the town. Um, they wanted us to comply with fire and building codes. Luckily, I was in a sh- situation where mine was so small that I could kind of work around all of their rules and regulations. Instead of having people walk through a structure, I had just kind of built like a little structure in my driveway and they, people walked around it. We kind of popped out from inside out. So we didn't have to kind of bring them in and bring them through a maze, which is what I was doing originally. Anyway, I could switch gears and go to a plan B, but he could not. He ended up getting an injunction on the town. The town, basically, the town couldn't go near his property until, you know, for weeks after Halloween. So he poked the bear. The bear got pissed. And they will not let him do anything on his property. He had been doing it for almost 11 years. He had a staff of people. So he actually had like a much bigger setup than mine. He had plenty of scare actors um, and helpers. And so since he's been shut down for the last couple of years, he shows up at my house on Halloween. And I let him kind of jump in into my thing. And he'll, he'll pop out and scare people. And he... The last three years, he keeps talking to me about doing something pro. Now, he has no idea that I do haunt cast, that I've talked to dozens of pro and, you know, I don't know how many home haunters and pro haunters and, you know, dealing with marketing professionals and consultants and all of these connections I have. Um, He's just kind of a person who did it in his yard and was oblivious to the rest of the world. Doesn't pay attention to any of the forums, Facebook groups. He just kind of did his thing. So now I'm trying to explain to him a little bit more of what I've been involved in for the last 10 years. And and that's going to be a little... I'm going to have to you know, get into more of that with him. But anyway, so the him coming back this year, he was really serious about doing something on a pro level. You know, getting some space... He's talking about having space available to us from a friend who owns a car dealership, et cetera, et cetera. So right now we're in the planning stages for the entire thing. But there is a very high probability that this could become a reality in 2019. I could be a a haunt owner, a pro haunt owner. So um, a entrepreneur, as they say, in the business. Indeed. Anyway. So here we are. Okay, so you're, if you're projecting an opening for 2019, that is indeed ambitious. Mm-hmm. Um, are, are you looking at a particular location? Do you have some sites in mind? I do have a couple of sites in mind in town, um, though I have not checked pricing on a few of the... There is an old Blockbuster video. Um, there is a couple of other... Sp- I mean, obviously retail spaces are opening... <laughs> are plenty nowadays right amazon right. gobbling up everything and in walmart and whatnot but the supposed free opportunity that we might have of doing something it would be outside it would probably be tented 
a little bit more on the smaller side. But uh, I think we'd be looking at probably no more than like 2,000 square feet, definitely under five. So uh, I don't know. So you, you would be you would be two to five thousand square feet in any of these locations. Is that correct? Probably yes. Okay. Okay. Um, let's let's. Well, hey, how did that dog get into Transworld? Zero. That's what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> He's a service dog. I put a vest on him. Oh, okay, no problem. So I can take Great. him everywhere. And you and you got the little the beer koozies on the side, so he's also a serving dog, which is which is just brilliant. I love that. Um, let's let's look to the past of the village mire. Um, when you started doing it, well, let's say from the time you started doing it until just this past Halloween, give me an idea of the attendance, like from first to last. How did it grow? Two thousand eight, two thousand nine, maybe even twenty ten. I wasn't doing any type of walkthrough. Okay. Most of it, it was just people would walk down the driveway. I'd have some stuff set up in the driveway. Uh, people would enter my mud room. I had like a little lab, whatever. You know, 20 people, then, uh, then maybe like 75, 100 people. Um, it was kind of slow the first, the first few years. I don't think we were doing much more than 100 people. Um, when we started doing the walkthrough, things jumped to about 200 after the walkthrough, year after that, we started, we probably easily went up to three. This year, we might have had about a thousand people here. Okay. So All right. We that's went from that's respectable. For having a walkthrough six years. And um, yeah, we went from a couple hundred to about a thousand and with really no marketing, no advertising, barely promoting it on Facebook. Just people. You know, contacting each other, you know, probably Facebook, messaging, you know, um, texting each other. Okay, so true word of mouth built your attendance over the years. That's it, yeah. Okay, now if you're, if you're looking ahead then to 2019 and beyond, what kind of uh, attendance do you think you'd be projecting? I mean, what kind of throughput could you handle at your... Excuse me. At your optimal location, whichever one of these places looks best to you right now, what do you think you could handle on a nightly basis, and how many nights do you think you might be open in a season? Um, probably Friday and Saturday night throughout October. Maybe the weekend after, you know, into November. Possibly Halloween night. So what? That's maybe ten. So let's see. You got. Ten four week, if you do four weekends in November, you get eight, ten, let's say probably 11, 11, 12 nights. Let's say 12 nights. No, let's say 13 nights because that's even better. <laughs> okay. So you might be open 13 nights. Oh, yeah, because there'd be the, uh, the Sunday night for uh, Columbus Day weekend. So probably right. uh, yeah, maybe yeah. a three day weekend there. All right. So. Again, looking at your optimal location, whether it's the Blockbuster or, or whatever, how, how many people do you think you could realistically put through that on a busy night? Hmm. I don't know. Um, That's not an easy question to answer yeah. if you... Now, now this, who might, this gentleman who might be my partner, John, John has, had been doing his uh, yard hunt for 11 years, he was open, um, I think, uh, you know, two days, you know, Halloween the day before. And I think he was even started opening up the weekend before that. Um, so he was opened up maybe three or four nights in, in October for his yard haunt. And I don't, you know, I'd have to ask him how many people he was putting through. But he had a waiting area. You know, he had people helping park cars in directing traffic. I really would need to check in and find out how many people, because he has a base that was coming to his house as well that we can market to. But, you know, I'm not sure, Dick. I, um, I don't know. Well, if you were able to do, to do. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. And it, it's hard not knowing the variables, especially your location. I mean, that's obviously the first thing you have to nail down. Um, but if, if you were doing 100 a night, over 13 nights, that's obviously 1,300 people, which is certainly not a bad season for a small haunt. But tell me about your area. 
Do you have uh, a significant number of colleges around there, like within a, you know, a, a 10, 20 mile radius? How about high schools? We've got plenty of high schools. We've got uh, Cape Cod Community College. There's also a branch of Bridgewater State or something else down here that has a branch on Cape Cod uh, that's right in my hometown. And Cape Cod Community College is only the next town over. Plenty of high schools. Uh, We have the uh, regional high school right here in town for Dennis and Yarmouth. You know, Barnstable right next door. Okay, so you got a lot of a lot of places you could draw from to get the younger crowd in. I'm certainly not dismissing uh, a more adult crowd, but that does lead me to my next question: Who would you be marketing this haunt to? I, I, is it going to be like a, a, a family friendly atmosphere, or are you going to go for a little more intense experience, or are you going to try to walk the line between those two? I think we would probably want to walk the line. We don't want, I don't think we would want to go full on and t- too intense. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm, I'm guessing like, okay. yeah, definitely teens through at least the thirties are like our target demographic. Um, the locations that you're looking at, how are you set for parking? Uh, one is a blockbuster video location and there's actually a few in that plaza that are all somewhat similar in, in, uh, in size. Plenty of parking there, though long-term, if it really was working well, we would probably would be, wouldn't be there for more than three to five years, I'd guess, before we would outgrow it. And would you be looking to rent the space, or are you thinking of owning? Uh, I would think to start off renting, and okay. then I would want to move into owning. Um, but... I would think that before, you know, don't want to buy until we know that we can, you know, that we can, until we can develop a, a successful business model, you know, until we can get it up off the ground. Okay. Okay. Now let's talk about the media outlets in your markets. I mean, do you have local TV stations? Do you have local radio stations? Um, are there big market stations Lo- near you? Local radio. Um, we have yeah we have a, a number of local radio stations uh, as far as TV, um, you know maybe like targeted Comcast. I I get hit up on this as well. I've never done this because my other business I do so much business without having to advertise that I don't mm-hmm. bother. Um, but maybe like I, the Comcast um, targeting in the local area, so the commercials are only playing to people. You know, in the local, uh, you know, Cape Cod area. Yeah, I love what Comcast Spotlight does with the ability to, you know, target specific areas, sometimes specific neighborhoods, if you want to. And depending on how much you want to put into it, um, you know, even kind of choosing a la carte programs or um, or channels or networks that you feel would reach right to the heart of your audience. Um, you also obviously have to look at social media. Uh, Snapchat ads are usually good. I don't know what they would charge you for those in your area or for what package you would be looking at. Facebook ads, uh, I'm not terribly crazy about them, but I've seen where they work really well. And um, you, you might want to investigate advertising through Twitter as well. But Again, it uh, depends entirely on what what packages or what prices they would offer you in your area, depending on your situation. So those are all things that you seriously have to look at. But um, you know Vic Barreto, right? I did. I talked to him a few nights ago. He talked a little bit about what he felt worked for him, what he felt didn't work for him. Like he told me, Fun 107, which is a Bristol County uh, top 40 radio station, which is you know, in that area, probably one of the biggest. It's not, though all the Boston stations reach down, uh, down here in you know Plymouth County for the in Bristol County for the most part. Um, he was just saying that he really got like no action off of Fun 107. He did get. Uh, he, he was doing uh, fairly well from the Comcast spotlight. He said that he was getting his ads were running during The Walking Dead and a number of other uh, shows that you know that pop up that time of year. So yeah, I kind of picked his brain a little bit about what worked for him and what didn't. 
Did he tell you about the Flyers? I don't think so. No, I don't uh, think that came up. Okay. See, when I was when I was talking to Vic a few years ago, and I did uh, I did the voice for his radio and TV commercials back then. Uh, one thing he also did was about four hundred dollars worth of flyers, and he had his his uh, cast members go out in costume and makeup, distributing these flyers throughout the community. Now you notice he did not send teenagers in t-shirts out, stuffing them under the windshield wipers at Stop and Shop. He sent characters out with flyers. That made it much more interesting and it made it much more impactful when a zombie hands you a flyer for a haunted house. It was cheap and as Vic told me, that's what he got the biggest return on. So that's definitely something you want to look at. So were people going door to door? I don't, I don't believe they were going door to door, but they were going to places where his audience would congregate. Uh, they would go to the mall. They would go downtown. They would walk around. They would, they would really go where the people were, which is obviously what you have to do with any form of advertising. Uh, I, I think door to door might be pushing it a little bit. and You might be, you know, in for some injuries or lawsuits at some point. But yeah, I mean, if you... Can you, can you imagine putting a zombie on a bus and, and have him sitting there with, with a stack of flyers? And depending on how good your actor is, would they just sit there pretending to be dead for the whole ride? And then, you know, somebody approaches them and they hand them a flyer. It, it's, it's much more fun. I mean, you're already, you're already immersing your audience in the experience. You're giving them a taste of how fun it's going to be if they do what this flyer says. So that's, you know, real grassroots, guerrilla marketing, cheap, 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 absolutely do it. You have to consider it. These are all little pieces of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, I, some of this is, you know, some of your advice, but that's not really how you make your money by having people walk around handing out flyers, right? So... Well, no, that's true because you, I, you know, you, you've really got to determine what your media mix is. And from what I know of your area, I, I believe that there is good, effective radio coverage there. And yeah, I know everybody's listening to their iPhone, but you know what? Every iPhone has an FM radio in it too. And the iHeartRadio is an app and they will be streaming stations. And really your entire audience from the youngest to the oldest, is at some point going to be listening to radio. And if yours is the best commercial on the air, it will definitely get heard, and it will definitely be responded to. Uh, the same is true of your TV commercials. Um, you know, what I always do is I aim for the highest quality work that gets your message through. If I can't do that, you should not have hired me. One thing I also count on is that most of the commercials that are going to be surrounding yours are crap. And what usually happens is, I've seen this happen in person, that, um, you know, if somebody's on the air, if somebody's a DJ, they're, they're going to want to make sure that their listeners stay with them, even though they have to do things called commercial breaks. What's the way to do that? You put your best commercial up front so that when... I finish up my weather forecast and say I've got whoever pop hit coming up next. The next thing I want them to hear is the best commercial I can possibly offer. You do the voiceover work for t TV commercials. Are you, you're writing the, the, the commercial. I, do you work with someone who does production on that or is that just outsourced? It's usually outsourced and it's usually outsourced by you. Uh, there are some people I know, uh, but often what you'll be able to find is something that's less expensive and probably just as good if you're looking around in your local market. And then what I will do is I will storyboard the commercial. We'll both look at it. We'll say whether or not we can do this. Is that possible? Do we have a budget for this? How much is it going to cost? And then we figure out if it, in fact, can be done locally. If not, there are definitely some places I can steer you to, but you're going to pay more for it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I try to, even though I do not do video myself, I stay very involved from beginning to end, from, from concept to creation through production to execution.
So I want to make sure that your message is absolutely consistent through your entire media mix, that what we're saying and doing in your radio commercial is not you know, 90 degrees different from what you're presenting on TV or what you're putting out there on social media so that people are, are not thinking that there are nine different haunted houses when it's actually just one, which is yours. What's your experience with like, Spotify and Pandora? Because they are commercial-based unless somebody buys into uh, the monthly fee, I think, right? That's, I believe that is accurate. Um, I am not certain because sometimes they change things on me and they don't tell me. Uh, Spotify, I have not had any experience with. I've had really great experience with Pandora. In fact, I've got a client on the West Coast who actually abandoned terrestrial radio one year and spent their entire radio budget on Pandora. And having done so, they found out that their click-through rate was four times greater than any other commercial that Pandora aired during that period that they were on, which was really impressive. And it did translate into ticket sales. So I, I do recommend Pandora. We talked about square footage and how many people we could bring through the door, the types of customers I'm looking for type of haunt we're going to do, whether it's intense, middle of the road, or, or kid-friendly. What else? Uh, well, actually, one idea I just had, you have a tremendous advantage with your smartphone business. What you need to do is everyone who brings their phone to you, you just hack into it and load your commercial on it. <laughs> Unethical? Perhaps. And then, Successful? It's genius! And then have it spam out every one of their contact lists. Exactly! <laughs> Well, I do have a way, like, I, as people are coming <laughs> in, I can be advertising out of my business because I'm getting people in constantly. So there, there is a way of me advertising out of my business. Oh, there is a big one in September down here that's called the Back to Business Bash, which would definitely be something I could probably uh, do something in there. Uh, same type of thing you were talking about, maybe having actors walk around. Versus, because it is like mid-September, which is perfect, kind of setting things up for the season. Well, is this a, a business-oriented type of gathering or what? It definitely is uh, more of a business thing, but there's got to be something that we could do there. Because, I mean, all these people have kids. I'm, I would assume most of them do. Um you know, I don't know if there's something. I mean, there might be something there. Well, September September is a little late to be hitting people up for sponsorships, but that might be a possibility. Uh, that, or, or it could even be setting the stage for the following year. I mean, if you show up and you've got a good crew of actors and you're just killing it there, they're going to want to get involved and they're at least going to want to come see it. And if that happens, then you've got some business folks around town who are, if they're smart, they're going to say, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see how I can get in on this too. And they could easily open up sponsorship opportunities for you. Now, Something does, to think about down the road. How do people make that work for them? Well, you know, Tattoo is the expert on this. I sat in on one of his sessions once where he talked exactly about this thing. And though this is not usually what I do, the thing I remember is you have to... Target very specifically who you want to be a sponsor, and you have to know what you want from them, and you have to know what you can give to them in exchange for their sponsorship. Um, if, if you're looking for cash, I mean, let's say you need $5,000. You can't just go in and say, for $5,000, you can be a sponsor of XYZ Haunt. They're going to throw it away. They're going to laugh you out of the room. But if you go in and say, uh, this haunted attraction is, uh, is brand new, and what we're trying to do is provide entertainment for the community, uh, and maybe you have a charitable cause that you're working with, too. You would definitely want to include that. And say what we're looking to do is raise $5,000 in sponsorship money for extra security, um, for uh, something that would make parking more convenient. In other words, you have to set a, a specific amount for a specific thing, and you have to ask them for it. In return, 
what do you give them? Well, you, you'll put their logo, you'll put their name on all your advertising, they'll have banner space, they'll be prominent on your website, whatever it is you feel is worth the value of what you're getting. And it's a lot of wheeling and dealing, but uh, I think you're pretty good at that. And um, it, it definitely look at that Back to Business Festival because I think that's going to be laying the groundwork for future partnerships and sponsorships. Like you said earlier, this may be a little ambitious for us to get this thing off the ground in 2019. Maybe it's a 2020. I'm but, thinking it's uh, more of a 2020. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I think it's 2020 because I know you want to do it right and you're going to do it right. And you've got a lot of ground to cover. So don't be terribly disappointed if you're not up by 2019. We obviously we need to try to secure a space. We I need to make sure that I have the right uh, that we can get a team together. I've got uh, a lot of haunt experience, and you know, you know, I can build sets. I can can build props. I you know, I know all. I know that side of of the business. You know, he had a crew that we could probably bring back in. Once again, we still probably need to hire and train. There's a lot going on, and I, I don't expect that we will definitely be up and running by, by 2019. But I figure if at least we're moving in the right direction and we can get many of these, uh, these goals accomplished, you know, we can be at least setting ourselves up for that. And then maybe right. I could do one last big home haunt promoting the shit out of our New thing happening the following year. Uh, that would be brilliant. Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, point everyone in that direction um, as this is going to be the last year here in the neighborhood. And, and you know, if your if your neighbors know here. that, yeah. if your neighbors know that, they might even get behind it all the way. <laughs> They'll finally support me. Exactly. You know, here I, I have one more question for you, and it may be a sensitive one. Uh, what is your what is your relationship with officials in your town? Like, um, do they do they slam the door when you show up at City Hall? Um, how are you How are you acquainted with uh, the fire marshal, police, ambulance? You know, people who might have a direct impact on what you're doing in your new business. I don't think anybody would badmouth me. I think I get along pretty pretty well with everyone. The fire, I have no problem with. The, the town, because I abided by their rules and didn't cause any problems, unlike my buddy John. That's my only concern about this guy, John, is um, I have to make sure that there's no problems with my relationship with him. If he were my partner, am I going to have issues with the town because... Uh, well, that that actually you know? that actually leads me to another point that if he is to become your partner, the two of you need to sit down and decide who has what responsibility. And if you feel strongly enough that you have a better connection with town hall, then you're the guy who handles that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you feel strongly that he is the guy who has the scene crew, he handles that. And you just you just lay it out. You you guys have to agree on what your individual responsibilities are instead of the two of you both trying to do everything and stepping all over each other. Yeah, it was, uh, I was reading Kelly Allen's book, and that was you know, one of the topics um, that he covers. And yeah, absolutely. I think everything needs to be in writing. We yep, need to know yep. exactly what the percentage breakdown is if we, when we make profit. So if we make profit, obviously I'm... The best case scenario is that we break even first year. That's all I, all I, I understand how this works. Um, I understand that there's also, you know, you could lose money the first year. I know that Vic lost money the first couple of years. It took him four years before he was break even. I get it. And he's but, certainly not the only one. I mean, that yeah. is the majority of, of the story that you're going to hear from, from most haunt owners that, uh, yeah, it, it you know, they broke even or they lost money, but if they stay in the game long enough and they keep improving the product and they keep pushing the hell out of it, then yes, you will begin to make money, hopefully sooner rather than later. I'm confident with my, uh, my, my ability, as I was in sales for years, to be able to get out there and knock on doors and talk to people and win people over <laughs> and, um, you know, to get sponsorships, etc., 
um, I need to, you know, just get a lot of information from other pro haunt, haunts as far as, you know, what did you do that was successful? Like, how did you pitch? Like, what was your pitch to whatever business um, to get their sponsorship? Or, you know, and I'm fairly confident that we could, you know, and I'm going to surround myself with good people. I would obviously I'd bring you in to do my marketing, probably hire Ed to come in and do some consulting work. Um, you know, draw up a, a, a floor plan and, and get us get us a starting off point, like have them design something for me. And I wouldn't necessarily need him to build it, but definitely would have him put the plans together, go through the code, help me out in that respect. Um, um, I know a lot of people have said that um, you need to have 100,000 starting up first year. Now, I'm not sure about square footage wise and you know what how, you know how they determine that you need a hundred thousand but like i say i'm not sh- I, I haven't asked enough people i haven't talked to enough pro haunt um, owners to find out well maybe they maybe they you did you have you know maybe they did need a hundred thousand but maybe you don't yeah. and as you say you do need to talk to other pro hunters um in similar markets and in different markets and, you know, clearly, you know people everywhere, and people are going to talk to you. So, absolutely, you need to tap that resource and tap it hard and apply it to your situation. And, you know, obviously, the first thing you need to do is decide if, in fact, you're going to have a partnership with John. And if, in fact, you're going to do that, then you have to nail down that location. And I firmly believe that the rest will spring from there. What else do I need to know? What other questions do you have for me? I know I should well, have these questions for you instead of you asking for me. <laughs> well, as you may have noticed, we, we haven't talked a whole lot about things that could truly be purely considered marketing or purely be considered advertising. We've talked about locations. We've talked about partnerships. We've talked about audiences. And these are all the things that are going to inform the message that we put out in your advertising, which is part of your marketing. Um, You know, marketing is fine-tuning the techniques you use to persuade a specific audience, and advertising is one of those techniques. So really, we have to answer answer all the other questions we've talked about before we can take it to the next level. And when we do, I will be ready. I will be ready to talk theme with you. I'm going to want to talk backstory with you. Um, we need to determine what is the mystery that can only be solved by the purchase of a ticket. Is the creation of name and theme part of a service that you provide? Um, there are people who have come to me like you who say, I'm, I'm going to open. I know I want to open. I have the place. Uh, I just need to know what to call it. And if you have any ideas for a backstory, let's do that. So, yeah, I have actually created backstories for haunts in in different parts of the country. But mostly when people come in, they know what they want to do. Um, They've already maybe heard a story from uh, local folklore that they've somehow turned on its side and turned it into an idea for a haunted attraction. And great, we've got our story. I can take it from there. Um, There was actually one situation uh, where a man had an established haunt, he and his family, and he asked me to do a commercial for him, and I did, based on the backstory that that he came up with. And when when I played his commercial for him the first time, there was just dead silence on the other end, which is usually a terrible thing. Uh, But then he said, damn. We, we're really going to have to improve our haunt to come up to the level of that. <laughs> and he did. He redesigned some things so that what he was presenting in his haunt was equal to what I was presenting in the commercial. So and sometimes one course, drives the other. And of course what you were presenting in the commercial was square footage. It was all about square footage. Yeah, I'm all about the square footage. You know me. That's right. Yeah, make sure you let everyone know exactly how many square feet you have in your haunt. (laughs) 
And, Never. And, and, the, and the laundry list. We have oh, lights. Yeah. We have fog machines. Yes, please list all your props, where you bought them, <laughs> uh, the name of every character, and who's playing them. Because when people come to a haunted house, they want to know that they're all actors, and it's all special effects, and it couldn't possibly be real. See, I've listened to a couple of those segments. I've listened to a few. <laughs> Yeah, you also, I'm, I'm you also should go back and listen to all the Marketing Morgue segments that I've ever done. Yes. Exactly. That's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm going to put all the Marketing Morgue segments and all the Theater of the Mind segments on a flash drive and go give it to John and go, sit down and just listen to these, okay? <laughs> go through every yeah. single one of these. And when you're done, get back to me. Yeah. yeah. And then I'm going to give you Kelly Allen's book and you read that and then let's talk next month and let's see where you're at. Are you still serious about doing this or not? Um, well, I think that would be the acid test, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if he's on acid at the time, that would be even better. Yeah, you know. <laughs> just don't just don't take the acid when we're open. No, know? no, no. Definitely what don't do that. Do on, oh. What you do on your free time is all about, you know, that's all you. Don't let me. I'm a libertarian. I don't want to get in your business, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, once again, I'm... I'm spitballing here because I just want to start getting, getting the process going because I don't see where this home haunt is going to be sustainable in the neighborhood right now. And, um, and to do something really cool that I really want to do, um, can't do it here. You know, it's got to be right. it's got to be in a professional capacity. And I need, you know, and I need staff. I need to. I, you know, so. If John can bring that to the table, I can bring my skills to the table, and then we can get the right people involved, like yourself, then then we've got a shot. Yeah, I'm in, brother. As soon as you get all of those all of those other key cornerstone issues settled, nailed down, you know what you're doing, then that's gonna lead to our next conversation. That forces you to do at least one more segment of the marketing morgue with me. That's true. Yeah, sorry. And I would be delighted to. I'm motivated, so let's see what happens. The best final piece of advice I can give you in all of this is do not just take my word for it. You need to get as, um, as many opinions as you can about this and just find what fits. Will do. Well, I better get to work. I've got a lot to do. <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> all right, until the next time, Mr. Terhune. Welcome Anytime in the marketing morgue where there's always room for one more. I'm going now. Heaven help you. Please like and follow the podcast. Stalk us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Links in the description. And help us by sharing Hauntcast with all your haunted Halloween brethren. Until next time, stay scary.